Hi, I'm Max Kaiser. This is the Kaiser Report. I'm going to teach you something about finance. It's called the Rule of 72. You take the rate of return, you divide it into 72, and it tells you how many years before you double your money. So if you're making 7% a year, 7 goes into 72 roughly 10 times. So you're going to double your money in 10 years. What if you were compounding at 70%? That would mean that you're doubling every year. 70% compounded, doubling every year. This is all going to make a lot of sense once we get into this with Stacy, Right, so we have a new administration in the United States and the party controls all houses of money printing, right? The, the US Congress can authorize new money printing and this in the lead up was what was already happening. So who knows what's gonna happen next? In case you really did miss it, U.S. money supply is growing at a pace of roughly 70% on an annual basis. That is just crazy. Here's the chart, and it goes back to the mid-70s. You can see Max and I have, for most of our lives, had it like a relatively normal ups and downs business cycle, the sort of cycles that we used to have across the economy, allowed in the economy. Well. This is, you know, the beginning of when they started intervening really hard with QE and blah, blah, blah. But now the money supply is berserk. That means that's going to double every year. So we go from three to six to 12 to 24 to 48. Within a few years, they're going to be printing 100, over $100 trillion, which makes sense because the economy is encumbered with almost half a quadrillion in debt and other unfulfilled liabilities. So uh, this is the beginning of the Venezuelan the Venezuela bolivarization of, you will see in the, in the litter bins across America, uh, dollars, paper money being thrown out and it's total garbage. I think it's probably why, if you look at the previous empire to the US, which was the British empire, they came into conflict with China as well, right? And it ended in the opium wars because China would not import anything from, from the United Kingdom. Like they didn't want any tweed. They didn't want any of the like scratchy wool products. <laughs> They're like, no, thank you. We don't want that. So they forced the opium on it. I think you see that the rising tension as the, the money printing started picking up, especially post 2008, you see that increasing tension as a reason to, um, you know, they're setting up the, the, the default situation because we already defaulted in 1971 when we went off the gold standard, but now the next default situation has to be like, we're gonna write off all these debts, the quad, you know, the several trillion that we owe China, we're just gonna write it off because obviously they're bad actors, they're hostile. So uh, I think that's what we're setting up for. Now, in terms of this $1.9 trillion plan they wanna pass straight away to, go, to coincide with the 900 billion that was passed in December, I mean, these numbers are just so crazy. Like I remember the beginning of this whole process back in 2008 when the financial crisis was happening right during that election and uh, Hank Paulson presented Congress with $700 billion a request. And he, he said, and it was like one page. And he said, well, we didn't want to ask for a trillion because it sounded like too much. <laughs> now it's just like three trillion last year, well, in the first half of the year, and then a, a tr almost a trillion in December, and now another 1.9 trillion. You're like, well, this is really starting to add up, right? Well, here's a, a stream of tweets from Jason Furman. He was a member of the Council of Economic Advisors to President Obama. And so very uh, left-wing progressive sort of uh, economist. And here are some of his thoughts on this. He's excited about the $1.9 uh, trillion plan, but he says it is very large. Together with the December legislation, it would be around $2.8 trillion, which is about $300 billion per month for the nine months that it is in effect. For context, in November, US GDP was about $80 billion below pre-crisis trend and compensation was about 20 billion below pre-crisis trend. So a total pre-crisis uh, trend decline was 100 billion a month. Now we're gonna print off $300 billion a month to make up for it. Right, remember 2008, the global financial crisis, Hank Paulson went to Congress and demanded $700 billion to bail out the banks. Yes. Okay, so at the time we said that 
uh, Barack Obama and his administration could have bailed out the debtors. Yes. That is to say the mortgage holders and the credit card owners. And it would be eventually less cost to America than bailing out the banks because the banks would become a abusive and they would keep leaning on the administration for more and more. That ended up being closer to $17 trillion, that bailout. <laughs> and what we said in 2008, right here on this show, was that because there was no attempt to reform what the banks had done and the global financial crisis was caused by the banks who were hoarding the cash, they were sitting on the cash, they weren't lending it. They were saying, nobody wants to borrow any money from us, so we're just going to hold on to it and we're going to invest in assets for our prize clients and they're going to buy exotic art and vacation homes and those prices will go up to 20 percent a year every single year for the next 10 years but nobody out there in america really wants the money or needs the money so we're not going to give it to them we said this is going to 10 to 12 years later cause a repeat but it would be 10 to 20 times worse okay here we are in 2021 exactly as we predicted they did not reform the banks in fact they just expanded their credit card they expanded their capacity to print and borrow and and give away the cash to their friends causing now this huge crisis. This gentleman is correct that it is an enormous number, and B, it's just going to inflame the fire of social unrest, hyperinflation, Bitcoin to $500,000. Thank you, politicians. I love being a Bitcoin billionaire. Right. What he means is that we're all pretty much going to be like, if we have a Weimar Germany sort of situation, anybody with any hard assets, you own a home, you own even a car, like things are going to be uh, rocketing in price if you own even like one Satoshi's worth of Bitcoin. Yeah, remember in Weimar it, Germany, the exchange rate for the German currency went from one to one with gold to yeah. a trillion to one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there were trillionaires. Yeah, trillionaires. That, were, that happened in Weimar Germany. Now, again, this guy, Jason Furman, he's, he is a bit concerned. He, he looks at the numbers and says, there is the one big problem with this, if you look at it from a top-down perspective, advocates of stimulus often point to multipliers like 1.5 or higher. In this case, the hope has to be that the multiplier is much lower. Otherwise, this would bring us way past what the economy can produce this year. So that's, that's him saying in academic speak that we don't want really high inflation because the multiplier, what especially he's talking about, is when the government prints up the $700 billion, like you're saying, that was treasury money, that was the U.S. government printing up money to give to the banker $700 billion. Well, obviously there wasn't much of a multiplier, right? That it turned into about $200 billion worth of GDP. We, and they pocketed the other $500 billion for themselves. So when you give it to ordinary people who are living you know, paycheck to paycheck, then the theory is that you know they go out and spend it. They you know they make their insurance payments and their car payments and they buy food and they go on vacation. They spend it, unlike bankers, right? And so that every dollar you give them should boost the economy by 1.5 dollars worth of GDP growth. But he's saying that's too high. That might be too much, considering that we're not actually manufacturing or producing any services here. So that could cause big inflation. Wait a minute. They've been arguing they want inflation. Now they're saying they're going to print some money, and if they get a GDP multiplier that would indicate inflation, that's, they don't want inflation. So this is a clearly duplicitous policy of not wanting inflation and wanting inflation that, by the way, results exactly as it always has in a few people getting all the printed money. So I, I don't know how to describe this as, in, as anything other than institutional corruption. Well... Get your wheelbarrow ready. That's what I say. <laughs> yeah, get your wheelbarrow ready down now. Got a wheelbarrow full of cash now. I got a ham sandwich that cost me five trillion. I'm living in the USA. <laughs> well, what Max means is that if there is hyperinflation, it's like Weimar Germany and what you saw in Weimar Germany, that is everybody became trillionaires, essentially. You had to, of course, carry all your wealth around in a, in a wheelbarrow in order to go buy some uh, bread. Right. Everybody's a trillionaire in Zimbabwe. You know, you can buy a $1 trillion note. Exactly. So we could all be billionaires. We're all going to be trillionaires because fiat has no bottom. You know, the dollar has no bottom and Bitcoin has no top. <laughs> Contemplate that. It's not even like you partisan or anything like that. It's just the facts are that if you throw trillions of dollars into the economy, now he's pointing out that this is the largest ever economic response in U.S. history. Now, if you could, of course, think of the Great Depression and what happened, we, we did similar programs, 
But what should we do? We put everybody to work. We built infrastructure. Here, they're just throwing money at it. No, everybody's in lockdown and at home. The economy is in a shambles, right? All the small businesses we think are closed. We're no, no more price signals and everything is, uh, there's rent moratoriums and mortgage moratoriums. And so we don't actually know the true state of the economy is the problem. And we're relying essentially on China to keep sending us goods because China is open for business. So it, hopefully they don't notice. Hopefully China doesn't notice because otherwise we might not have any goods to uh, purchase. Uh, we're relying on the handouts of them that they're going to keep on taking us money and that they're not going to you know, that they're not going to notice that we're we're about to print up another three trillion. Maybe, maybe they won't notice. Hopefully they don't watch the show and find out. I've always relied on the kindness of strangers. Exactly. Blanche Dubois. America has become Blanche Dubois. Well, you know, it's not like every country has lost the lessons of what happened during the 1930s uh, about putting people to work, and that would be China. Because they can. Like, Europe is also shutting down, but they're presumably going to have to match our money printing. That's the problem with having the world's reserve currency be an all-fiat system, because other countries will have to match our money printing, because it's a beggar-thy-neighbor situation. So if they don't want to have their own, <laughs> you know, uh, collapse in their own currency, it, it, and this, by the way, this pr money printing will cause a disruption in the Forex market. We don't know how that's going to play out. It could cause turmoil in other locations. And if it causes high inflation in agricultural goods, like we saw back in 2008, by the way, that led to all those revolutions that happened, the Arab uprisings, uh, you know, that was a lot of it was prompted by really high uh, wheat prices. So there, it, there was a huge protest and, and riots in uh, Haiti at the time, too. So we could see a situation like that as the empire, the center, tries to hold. It's the, it's the outside of the center that gets locked out of the drawbridge and they have to fend for themselves. So we don't know what the spillover effects are, but um, even this guy, Jason Furman, who was an advisor to you know, Obama's disastrous economic decisions. <laughs> like, he's saying, well, this could be a disaster, but, like, let's just throw money at the situation. Right. Remember, as we warned four years ago, deglobalization, yep. de-dollarization. Yep. Now, four years later, we see what that means. We're going to take a break, and when we come back, Gerald Salente. Welcome back to the Kaiser Report. I'm Max Kaiser. Time now to go to... A long-standing tradition here on Kaiser Report. We can't start a new year without talking to Gerald Salente of the Trends Journal to give us uh, insight and what we can expect. Gerald, welcome back. Oh, thanks for having me on. So the Trends Journal Happy New Year 2021 report is out. The free money of the COVID-2020 response caused a wealth and income gap explosion in terms of income. Some were easily able to work from home. Many low-income workers, like in hotels and restaurants, childcare, et cetera, were not. Does this in income gap continue, Gerald? In other words, the COVID-19 prompted this huge response from the federal government, and it seems to have caused a lot of problems. I I is that more of that in store for us in 2021? Oh, much more. Look what's going on. Well, you're, you're a non-essential business if you're just the mom and pop, the his and hers or hers and hers business. But if you're Costco, if you're Walmart, if you're uh, Target, it's okay. You can open, no limitations. But all you small businesses got to go out of business. So the bigs are getting bigger in every way. And you look at the facts. Look at the, all the merger and acquisitions are, that are going on right now uh, and, and went on. As the smalls are going down, the bigs are getting bigger. So the wealth gap keeps getting wider. And you know the data, what, what the billionaires in America got a trillion dollars richer among them. So, no, this is just going to continue to get worse as more and more small businesses go out, the hotels are being bought up, on and on and on. A lot of people are likening these tech guys to feudal lords and that Americans have become new uh, class of serfs. Your thoughts? Well, yeah, well, I call it we are the plantation workers of Slavelandia. Let's go back to when the COVID war began. And that's the term that they used, by the way, when they launched this. We're in a war, we're in a war, we're in a war. So everybody marched off to war. Where did the war start? Well, the war in America started in the state of Washington. Kirkland, Washington, nursing homes. People started 
who were dying in nursing homes from the COVID. Who's the first place to close down? That guy with the beard and the rings and the thing, you know, what's his name? Dorsey, Twitter. Who's going to go to South Africa? This is in February of last year. Canceled his trip. Everybody could work from home. Then who closed down? San Francisco, Silicon Artist Valley, Silicon Artists. They were the first to close down. You could work from home. You could work from home. You could work from home. Oh, hey, look at those tech stocks. As everybody's not commuting anymore, now you're Zoom and you're this and that. And what did their tech stocks go up last year, uh, 43% on the NASDAQ? So they're the ones that benefited from this, and they're the ones that started selling the fear and hysteria. And you have another case of what many call disaster capitalism. Uh, you know, going back to the uh, anti-globalization protests in uh, Turin, Italy, going back almost 20 years now, and through Occupy Wall Street and the works of Nomi Klein and her books, this idea of disaster capitalism writ large with this recent COVID disaster, but the causes of it seem to have shifted. I'm hearing a new phrase, and I, I know you're quite the wordsmith and love to hear new things. What do you think of this new phrase that's coming out called disaster liberalism? I haven't heard it before, but it sounds just about right. And it's not liberalism. Uh, uh, liberal, liberalism is dead. They've, uh, they've destroyed the meaning of it. Um, I call them lib actually. Uh, it's, a, it's a different form of a communism, uh, as people would say it. But you know what I think it is? I think it's anti-Americanism. It's not the country that this was the country where you came here and it was the land of opportunity. So they keep taking the money and they throw it out to the peasants of Slavelandia to give them a couple of bucks here and there, here and there. You're all right. You don't have to worry. Take it easy. We're in charge. We're in control. We'll tell you what to do. Do this, do that, do this, and here's your money. Here's your money. Shut up. So they give them enough to just to keep them quiet. So you've been forecasting over there at Trends Journal. Um, you've been tracking this for quite some time, and you've been saying, look, the, the civil unrest that's happening in the country is a direct result of this wealth and income gap. It's the result of all this fiat money printing. And um, it's, uh, it, it's tragic, and it's unfortunate. And we, ha we should talk about it, uh, even though just talking about it would, according to the... Uh, the disaster liberals in Washington, would they would classify us immediately as untouchable. But nevertheless, we must speak on this topic. Will the social unrest continue as a re direct result of the plutocracy and the cacistocracy that's printing America into the toilet, Gerald? Yes, in many different ways. And 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 again, this is be, it's a, again, as, it, it, as you said, they would censor us for saying the wrong thing or attack us. Hate Trump, love Trump. Could you imagine censoring the president of the United States? I mean, if another country that we, the United States wanted to attack, that would be a reason for them to attack the country. You see, they censored the president. We have to go in there. So going back to the violence, what's going to happen, Max, it's going to happen at a lot of different levels. You're a young kid. 42% of the children born in the United States are born to single parents. You don't know who your father is. Your mother may be whacked out on drugs. Life stunk before all this happened. Now you're miserable as can be. You're not making any money, not going to school. Things are really terrible. You think you're going to join the gang? There's going to be gang violence like we've never seen before. The social unrest on one end as the divided states of America, yes, that's going to happen as well. But we're going to look at the numbers. They're coming out already. We said this would happen back when they started shutting everything down. When people lose everything and have nothing left to lose, they lose it. And they're losing everything. So you're seeing what? Homicide rates going up across the country. So it's going to get much worse, yes. Right. You know what's happening in the U.S.? It reminds me of the Maidan in uh, Ukraine, uh, so-called color revolution. And some of the U.S. public officials involved in that are now being nominated by <laughs> the president to be in his cabinet. Um, so uh, the chickens are come home to roost uh, in a lot of ways, Gerald. I mean, you and I have been around for a while. A lot of the, the coups, the revolutions, the color revolutions, 
that the U.S. has perpetrated on these countries for decades as part of our foreign policy to take the world's wealth and give it to Americans. It, it's coming home to roost. Uh, we've run out of countries to invade, so we're going to invade ourselves, Gerald. Yeah, yeah, I think you've nailed it perfectly. And yes, you made the point about the, the revolution and the, or the, the overthrow of the government in Ukraine and with the was Victoria Nuland handing out cookies. And now she's, it's the Obama administration is back. Basically, that's it. So it's a repeat of what it was. And um, it, it's going to be disastrous in so many ways, not because of that administration or any of them. It, the, the whole system is a failure. I mean, look at them. You know, you're, you're talking, I, this, this is what, from two days ago? The United States government deficit in the first three months of the budget year was a record-breaking $572.9 billion, 60.7% higher than the same period a year ago. And now what are they going to do? Dump in another $1.9 trillion. I love how they come up with the $0.9 trillion. Hey, how about $2 trillion? Could you say $2 trillion? No, no, no. It's $1.9. It's not that bad. They're creating all this digital trash backed by nothing and printed on nothing. This is unprecedented, and it's going on around the world. Right. I mean, Paul Krugman of the New York Times will argue that, well, it's, uh, we're just money that we owe ourselves, and there's no limit to it. We can print this debt all day long. Uh, he doesn't seem to take into consideration the social unrest it's causing and the poverty it's causing and the disenfranchisement of millions of young Americans that it's causing. How does... It's like a Paul Krugman character, you know, he's in the media, he's at the New York Times. How do, does he willfully just push, is he just, can we just say once and for all he's a propagandist and move on and forget that he's trying to be honest in any way? Yeah, it's the, as I call the New York Times, they call themselves the paper of record. I call them the, the, the toilet paper of record. You know, and, and we, we, it was a story I just did uh, yesterday on uh, one of their pieces, their articles over here about what's going on in Oklahoma and how the people aren't wearing masks over there, and how terrible it is, and how the, if I have it here somewhere, how the, uh, uh, how the, the cases are skyrocketing. So I started looking it up. They love Governor Cuomo over here in New York, the daddy's boy, born on third base and who hit a home run, you know, that closed down this place and destroyed. You can't go out and eat. You can't go into a restaurant. You know what the infection rate is in the restaurants, according to the New York State Health Department? 1.43%. But I'm Andy Cuomo, executive order. We're going to shut it down, and everybody loves Cuomo. The infection rate in New York State, uh, the death rate from the viruses in New York State per 100,000 is 207 but the New York Times, who that guy Slugman, Grugman, Glugman works for, the propagandist, the toilet paper of record, they go after Oklahoma because the people aren't wearing masks. The death rate in Oklahoma per 100,000 people, I look it up, is 70. But they attack them. And that's what the newspapers have done. That's what the media has done. And now the technocracy is in charge. There is no freedom of speech. You will only do what I tell you to do and believe what I tell you to believe. If you believe in anybody else, we have a label for you. We'll call you a right-wing conservative, and we'll call you a conspiracy theorist if you don't believe what we tell you. Right. Well, the New York Times doesn't deliver many newspapers to Oklahoma, Gerald, so... That's expendable. <laughs> uh, let me ask you an economic question. Uh, all this money printing, they claim it doesn't cause inflation, even though it's the biggest asset bubble in history, certainly. Uh, but are we going to start to see real CPI inflation prints, like food and energy and stuff like that, actually going up now that the dam is broken and the ability to, to this farce to continue is over, Gerald? Yes, I call it dragflation. The economy is going to continue to drag down and inflation is going to continue to go up. And as you well know, it was Slick Willie Clinton that began rigging the inflation numbers. So they're much higher than they are now that they're reporting because if the inflation numbers go up, 
the CPI goes up, then they have to give more money to people on Social Security and other benefits, and they don't want to do that so they can keep more money for themselves. Already you're seeing food prices and energy, as you mentioned, going way up, lumber, so many essential items are going up. But what's artificially dragging it down, they'll throw in there what the hospitality sector is doing, what the restaurant sector is doing, so that artificially brings down the number. Yes, you're going to see skyrocketing inflation, and that's, look, I mean, how could they not have it when they're printing all this money, just dumping it in one central bank after another, and that's why I'm still very bullish on gold, silver, and Bitcoin. Cool. We're going to do a second segment. Got to say goodbye for now, though, Gerald. Thanks for being on Kaiser Report. And thanks for having me. All right, and that's going to do it for this edition of Kaiser Report. With me, Max Kaiser and Stacey Herbert, special guest, Gerald Salente of the Trendsjournal.com. Till next time, bye, y'all.